for the beginning of this uh, session, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to present you Bertrand Badiou uh, from uh, uh, Paris, École Normale Supérieure, who is uh, uh, the other voice, we might even say, or the, uh, uh, the voice Autre Tombe de Paul Celan, uh, which is uh, uh, Professor Badiou will tell us more about his work uh, through the uh, text that he's going to present, but uh, what I wanted to stress now is that uh, uh, Professor Badiou uh, is uh, responsible uh, for the um, okay. poetical heritage of Paul Salon and of his archives that are at uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure, and uh, he knows uh, maybe uh, certain things, certain details uh, that he's uh, going to discover to us and that we are here privileged to, to hear maybe for the first time. Uh, I will not keep you any longer, so uh, Professor Badiou, please. Thank you very much. It's a shame for me, but I do not speak English. Uh, bon, je, d'abord, uh, je vous salue et je, je vous remercie de votre attention. Je vais tenir mon propos en français et pour introduire mon propos, je vais simplement dire qu'en France, Paul Solan écrit son œuvre en allemand en France euh, et qu'en France, il prononçait son nom Paul Solan et qu'en allemand, il le prononçait à l'allemande Paul Zeller. Voilà. Donc il était déjà dans, entre les deux langues. Hein. J'aurais pu faire cette conférence en allemand, il était auf Deutsch sagen aber heute werde ich Französisch sprechen. La dimension testimoniale des manuscrits et écrits de Selon. Il va de soi qu'une réflexion sur la dimension testimoniale de la poésie de Paul Selon ne peut que présupposer connu l'essai de Jacques Derrida, poétique et politique du témoignage, qui s'attache avant tout à l'approche du poème Ashen Glorie, publié dans Atemwende en 1967. Je ne rappellerai pas tout ce que Derrida a mis au jour en partant de la première strophe, de la, de la fameuse strophe finale de ce poème, écrit le 15 décembre 1964. Niemand zeugt für den Zeugen. Pas plus que je ne reviendrai sur ces réflexions philologiques et philosophiques à propos des notions de Zeuge, témoin, bezeugen, attesté, témoigné, procré même. Bezeugung, témoignage, attestation, preuve, zeugnis, attestation, témoignage, déposition, mise en rapport avec celle de testis, témoigna, témoin. Terstis, celui qui dans un procès se pose en tiers, superstes, en latin, survivant, mais également marturion en grec, ancien, qui signifie à la fois témoin et preuve. Ces deux choses ne sont pas indifférentes, cette, cette, cette alliance sémantique. Comme je suppose connu et admis le fait que celui qui témoigne n'apporte pas de preuves et que son acte, qui est un acte de foi, suppose un serment initial. Derrida aborde aussi le problème de la finitude du témoignage, de la possibilité du mensonge et donc aussi du parjure. Tout ceci pour justifier que je me réfère à Derrida le plus souvent de façon implicite. Je suis parti de sa réflexion en me laissant solliciter par elle et entraîné dans un champ qui m'est familier, celui des archives. Mon propos espère cependant parvenir à déborder quelque peu celui d'un archiviste. Dans quelle mesure les manuscrits de Selon ont-ils une dimension testimoniale Comment et de quoi ces écrits peuvent-ils être témoins Idéalement, il faudrait prendre appui aussi sur l'ouvrage de Giorgio Agamben, « Quel que resta di Auschwitz, l'archivio e il testimone », et même sur celui de Paul de Raoul Hilberg, euh, euh, « Perpetuals, victims, bystanders ». Dans ma contribution, qui ne peut être vu le format qui lui a été imparti, qu'une façon de, se, de lancer sur quelques pistes de réflexion, je me référerai principalement à quelques significations du substantif « témoin » en français, selon le dictionnaire « trésor de la langue française ». Étant entendu que l'emploi que cela fait du mot allemand « zeuge 
est inévitablement marqué par la signification du mot censé être son équivalent français. Selon écrit, en effet, ses poèmes en France, et sa langue quotidienne, il faut y assister, est le français. Témoin est la personne qui, par ses paroles et par ses actes, son existence même, porte témoignage. Mais aussi le créateur qui, par son œuvre, donne de l'époque où il a vécu une image particulière. Témoin est une preuve matérielle, un indice, un, une pièce à conviction. Je me réfère enfin aussi au sens suivant. Témoin est une chose qui permet de constater, de vérifier. Le mot alors a pour signifie, synonyme marque et repère. Cela a commencé à dater les manuscrits de ses poèmes dès ses débuts poétiques, et en particulier durant ses années d'internement dans les camps de travail roumain entre 1942 et 1944. Ce soin traduit chez lui sans doute la conscience de l'importance, en allemand « bedeutung », qui signifie à la « sens » et « importance », des coordonnées temporelles et spatiales de l'expérience qu'enregistre et interprète le poème. Même si le poème porte un nom de fleur qu'il a inspiré, celui qui le consigne dans un carnet le tient pour une page de son journal des années du Troisième Reich. Les manuscrits de poèmes de ce qu'on appelle aujourd'hui le « fruwerk » exhibent déjà souvent leurs coordonnées qui ont une valeur de signature. Après les années de guerre, cela se montre plus négligent. Nombreux sont les poèmes de Mon ou Gedeknes qui ne portent pas ce genre de mention. Même curieusement, la fondamentale Todesfug, fugue de mort, en est dépourvue. Ce n'est qu'après 1953, c'est-à-dire après la première accusation publique de plagiat portée contre lui par Claire Gold, que cela se soucie vraiment à nouveau de dater ces manuscrits. À partir de mai 1960 et durant les années qui suivent, et qui correspondent à la phase aiguë de ce qu'il appelle désormais l'affaire Gol ou l'infamie, ce soin, ce souci de dater, devient chez lui habitus. Il s'agit désormais de s'assurer que les manuscrits de ses poèmes puissent constituer les preuves d'authenticité de, de leur inspiration. Le poète garde et classe méticuleusement, avec l'état définitif du poème, selon l'ordre génétique, le premier jet et toutes les versions de travail systématiquement datées, parfois à la minute près. Il le fait non par narcissisme maniaque, mais parce que le, la documentation révèle que le poème ne résulte pas d'une fabrication, d'un montage de morceaux, mais que tout au long du procès d'écriture, il est d'une seule pièce, donc à chaque étape, 1. Pour bien comprendre cela, il faut savoir que Claire Gaulle, pour étayer ses accusations de plagiat, s'était livré à toutes sortes de manipulations des, mari des manuscrits de son mari Ivan Gaulle. Selon elle, la victime, le plagié, qu'il s'agissait de défendre contre l'usurpateur et l'imposteur, selon, qui connaissait le succès qui était en fait dû à son défunt mari. Pour fonder ses accusations, Claire Gaulle ira jusqu'à fabriquer un fond posthume Ivan Goll, en antidatant ses manuscrits et même en introduisant dans les dactylogrammes de sa confection des expressions et tournures en provenance des poèmes de ce nom. Il faut savoir qu'Ivan Goll, poète bilingue, donc français et allemand, ne s'était remis à écrire en allemand que peu de temps avant sa mort et sous l'impulsion de ce nom, qui lui avait offert un, exemple, un exemplaire corrigé à la main de son livre de poèmes « Das Amt aus den Urnen ». Le volume criblé de fautes d'impression avait dû être, hélas, immédiatement retiré du marché. La faussaire pouvait donc, continue, donc laisser libre cours à ses agissements. C'est dans ce contexte, donc aussi en réaction aux accusations de plagiat, d'abord discrètes, puis diffusées dans une revue à faible tirage, mais ensuite très vite relayées par la presse nationale allemande, que cela théorise sa pratique de la datation. Il le fait à l'occasion de la rédaction de son discours de récipiendaire du prix Georg Büchner, qu'il prononça le 22 octobre 1960 à travers une méditation sur la date du 20 janvier, sans précision d'année dans le discours, rencontré dans la nouvelle de Büchner intitulée Lenz. C'est le jour de la marche du poète Lenz à travers les Vosges en Égypte. Petite catastrophe, le code.
Er, der wahre, der büchnerische Lenz, der Lenz, der den 20. Jänner durchs Gebirge ging, er als ein Ich. Il se trouve que cette date est aussi, mais cela ne le dit à aucun moment explicitement dans son discours, même s'il le répète à quatre reprises, celle de la planification de l'anéantissement des Juifs d'Europe le 20 janvier 1942. Cette date devient dans sa pensée le parangon de toute date. Vielleicht darf man sagen, dass jedem Gedicht sein 20. Jänner eingeschrieben bleibt. Vielleicht ist das Neue an den Gedichten, die heute geschrieben werden, gerade dies, dass hier am deutlichsten versucht wird, solcher Daten eingedenkt zu bleiben. Ich hatte mich das eine wie das andere Mal einen von einem 20. Jänner, von meinem 20. Jänner hergeschrieben. Conséquence. Dans chacun de ses poèmes, avec ses dates spécifiques en lien avec toutes sortes d'événements et d'expériences vécues, le lancement d'un satellite, la manifestation contre l'OAS, c'est dans le contexte de la guerre d'Algérie, contre l'OAS à Paris en février 1962, la guerre du Vietnam, la guerre des six jours, mai 68, l'entrée des chars soviétiques dans Prague, etc. On pourrait en, en faire une liste infinie. Cela reste fidèle à sa vocation initiale. Tous les poèmes s'inscrivent dans la continuité, la logique du trauma premier. Cela en tire un fil qui traverse les expériences et les relie à l'événement qui fonde sa vocation. Sa poésie reste, à chaque étape de son processus d'apparition, un mémorial, un cénotaphe, à l'instar de la tour de Sfouré dont il dit qu'elle est une épitaphe et une tombe pour sa mère qui n'en a pas d'autre. Deuxièmement, deuxième conséquence, Claire Goll, dont la mère avait péri à Auschwitz, était allée portant assis l'estocade jusqu'à écrire sa triste légende qu'il savait évoquer de façon si tragique, nous avait bouleversé. Ses parents tués par les nazis, lui apatride, un grand poète a compris comme il le répétait sans cesse. Les accusations alors portées contre lui reviennent aux yeux de Selon à nier la source d'inspiration de ses poèmes, à nier l'authenticité de la mania sienne. Je renvoie à un texte fondamental pour la conception de la poésie de Selon qui est le Phèdre de Platon et un passage très très beau où Socrate exprime qu'il a une préférence pour la poésie qui est d'inspiration et, et qu'il n'aime pas la poésie du calcul. Donc, la mania sienne, la fureur poétique, induite par ce qui ne porte alors pas de nom, par ce qui s'est passé, c'est comme ça que selon l'appelle, et qu'on appellera ensuite, surtout en France, après et d'après le film de Claude Lanzmann, Shoah. À la négation de l'authenticité de la poésie, selon, de selon, correspondrait donc une sorte de négationnisme. Si selon accumule des preuves dans et par la collection de ses manuscrits, c'est donc également pour pouvoir étayer son témoignage contre toutes les formes de négationnisme, aussi contre celles qu'il rencontre sous la plume des critiques littéraires allemands qui écrivent sur sa poésie. Et s'il écrit le plus souvent ses poèmes au stylo plume, donc à la main, c'est parce que le ductus de l'écriture manuscrite correspond à la complexion singulière de celui qu'il écrit en traduisant l'expérience qu'il fait. Il résume sa pensée à ce sujet dans une formule qui a fait date. « Nur wahre Hände schreiben wahre Gedichte. Ich sehe keinen prinzipiellen Unterschied zwischen Händedruck und Gedicht. » La main qui écrit est celle de celui qui prête serment avant de témoigner. Cela ne considère cependant pas que ses seuls manuscrits comme des témoins de la genèse de ses poèmes et donc de son Atemgang, de la marche de son souffle. C'est un ancien titre pour le volume qui s'est intitulé en définitive Artemis. Ces marques de lecture dans les livres, rarement datées, sont parfois relevées d'un petit I inscrit dans la marge, qui apparaît comme un témoin, un témoin lumineux, signalant qu'à l'endroit en question du texte, une lumière a jailli dans son esprit de lecteur. Cet œil constitue souvent le premier état d'une idée poétique 
inspiré par la lecture. Il est manifeste qu'il importe à Solon de le signaler, d'abord à ses ipsum, bien sûr, mais peut-être aussi au-delà de soi. Il lui arrive même de remarquer avec satisfaction que ce qu'il a déjà écrit, voire publié, rencontre dans une heureuse coïncidence ce qu'il lit. Il note alors en marge, pour fêter ce petit événement, « Pichte et confirmation. Après 1965, et surtout après l'automne 1966, donc au moment où, séparé de sa femme, Solon ne dispose plus des livres de sa bibliothèque, qui resteront en grande partie dans le logement conjugal, on le voit se promener dans Paris avec, sous le bras, sa bibliothèque portative que, consti que constitue à présent pour lui la presse des journaux. À la façon des oulipiens, et pour répondre aux besoins d'écrire, ce qu'il appelle alors le poème quotidien, cela se plonge comme de force dans les journaux. La Fatz, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, Die Zeit, oder Neue Zürcher Zeitung, oder Der Spiegel. Acceptant de mettre sa pensée en mouvement dans le champ contraint qu'il représente. C'est souvent dans les pages réservées aux sciences qu'il découvre alors les mots, les tournures, et parfois même les syntagmes dont il a besoin pour continuer à dire pour dire autrement encore. Il les déploie sous forme de poèmes qui résultent parfois de la coagulation de choses lues en provenance d'articles hétérogènes. Durant cette ultime phase du développement de son écriture, ce lent provocateur pratique une sorte de plagiat délibéré. Aux accusations de plagiat, ce lent répondrait donc, en souriant sous cap, par la multiplication d'emprunts. Il va de soi que, même si les poèmes entretiennent des liens troublants avec les objets textuels qui les ont inspirés, ils restent traversés par son fil. Comme Midas, dès que cela en touche à l'écrit d'un tiers pour le tirer à soi, il en fait son or. Curieusement, alors qu'il a conservé de nombreux articles sur des sujets qui l'intéressent, cela n'a gardé aucun de ses articles inspirateurs que seul le travail patient et systématique de Barbara Biedemann a permis d'identifier. Cela a-t-il délibérément voulu garder le secret de la jeunesse de ses poèmes tardifs Dans ses poèmes, cela ne porte pourtant pas moins témoignage sur son temps, sur son vécu, que dans ceux qui, qui les précèdent. Mais il a souhaité ne pas laisser de traces de leur surgissement ailleurs que dans les manuscrits eux-mêmes. Est-ce parce qu'il souhaite que ses poèmes, en leur qualité, d'actes de foi sans preuve possible, Derrida, témoignent hors de toute possibilité d'exhiber des preuves extérieures à eux-mêmes. Renoncent-ils avec eux à fournir des preuves en continuant de témoigner Il faut pour finir souligner que si la date a incontestablement la vertu de permettre le témoignage en faveur du poème et de son authenticité, cela a de très rares exceptions près à choisir de les publier sans ces indicateurs qui les ancrent dans le vécu et dans le temps. Bien qu'il ou parce qu'il eussent pu constituer de précieuses clés pour leur déchiffrement et leur interprétation. La date risquait-elle de, de rabattre le poème sur l'expérience d'où il est issu, sur un référent immédiat, le privant de sa qualité de témoin hissé hors de la vie, dans l'existence. Tout d'Arst, pourquoi ce poème D'abord parce que son titre Inchipit constitué de l'auxiliaire de mode Durfen, m'a semblé dans sa vertigineuse simplicité des plus provocateurs. Avoir la permission de pouvoir, devoir, se couvre le premier poème d'Artenwend, intitulé Du Darfst, en posant implicitement la question de l'identification du tu et donc aussi du jeu qui se pose partout dans l'écriture de Selan, Gadam en a souligné, est programmatique et donc décisive. Celui qui écrit ces mots prend la liberté de se référer à l'interprétation qui en a été proposée récemment par Denis Thouard dans « Pourquoi ce poète ?» le selant des philosophes. Il s'agit de mettre cette interprétation à l'épreuve d'une part du témoin de la jeunesse du poème que constitue le dactylogramme de la première version connue qui a été conservée par Selant, et d'autre part de la mettre à l'épreuve du témoignage d'ordre biographique que j'apporterai pour tenter de valider une autre interprétation diamétralement opposée à celle de toi. Étant entendu que cela n'ignorait pas le sort 
qui allait être réservé à ses archives littéraires, les manuscrits ou dactylogrammes, les premières versions de poèmes sont, sont-ils le lieu où se trouvent gardés, je fais encore référence à, à, à Mérida, leur vérité respective Est-il possible à l'interprète d'avoir accès à cette vérité par leur biais Il faut aussi éviter de penser naïvement, et en commettant ainsi l'erreur euh, qui consiste à sacraliser l'origine, que la première version d'un poème correspondrait systématiquement à l'intention ultime du poète. Il arrive en effet, on le sait, que le poème dise à la fin du processus d'écriture strictement le contraire du premier manche. En tout état de cause, une version de travail d'un poème peut constituer un indicateur permettant d'orienter une interprétation. Voici ce bref poème écrit à Paris le 16 octobre 1963. Du mit Schnee bewirken, so oft ich Schulter an Schulter mit dem Maulbeerbaum schritt durch den Sommer, schrie sein jüngstes Blatt. S'opposant à la lecture problématique de Hans-Georg Gadam dans Wer bin ich und Wer bist du, et croyant marcher dans les pas de Jean Belac, Thouard décrypte le mot Maulbeerbaum, qui désigne en allemand le mûrier, Morus L, et sans doute très précisément Morus Alba L, en prétendant qu'on ne saurait ignorer la resémantisation due à l'attention portée aux composants du mot. Maul, gueule, Maul, beer, mur, Maul, L, grande gueule, fanfare. Toujours sous la plume de Thuar, le Maul, beer, baum fait son œuvre, il produit à répétition une fausse littérature de sa gueule terrible. Le Maul, beer, baum est un arbre à parole, est un monstre verbal qui dit toutes les contrefaçons du langage. Le mensonge est par lui répété sous des aspects toujours nouveaux. L'arbre, mauvaise parole, laisse échapper un langage torturé et violent, un cri que le poète analyse. En tout état de cause, l'interprétation qui peut en être faite après le développement qui va suivre a choisi de prendre la direction opposée. Curieusement, mais fort heureusement, Thouar ne va pas jusqu'à rappeler dans ce contexte la gueule de travers, Schreck Maul, de la contrescarpe, du poème La Contrescarpe, qui rappelle inévitablement Goebbels. À y regarder de près, Gardam ne conteste pas à tort l'autonomie, certes relative, de Maul dans Maulbeerbaum. Pour ma part, parce que je disposais d'informations biographiques de première main, je ne pouvais pas imaginer que cet arbre au nom si expressif, lorsqu'on le prononce, on en a merveilleusement plein la bouche, pût avoir une valeur négative. Cela avait en effet, dans un geste superstitieux, planté trois mûriers un pour chaque membre du trio familial, Gisèle, Eric son fils et lui-même, dans le jardin de la propriété à Moiville, dans l'heure, que les Selans avaient acquise au printemps 62. Ces trois mûriers, je les ai vus, de mes yeux vus, lors des séjours répétés à Moiville dans les années 1980. Maul Birbaum évoque aussi inévitablement la variation intraduisible sur le nom de Mandelstam dans un air de filou et de brigand. Ein Gauner und Ganovenweise. Mandeltraum, Handelmaum, und auch dem Handelbaum, Handelbaum. Cet arbre, le Morus Alva L, je l'ai nommé spontanément lors d'une interprétation à l'ENS avec mes étudiants, l'arbre juif de la poésie. Comment imaginer que le cheminement du jeu, épaule contre épaule, donc dans une intimité avec le Maulbeerbaum, puisse être cons conservé puisse être négatif. Peut-être faut-il même aller jusqu'à entendre derrière le mot « schulte » le français « épaule », écho du prénom « Paul », comme à la fin de l'unique poème de Solan écrit en français dans lequel il s'adresse à son fils « Ton père t'épaule ». S'ajoute à tout cela la première version connue du sextile qui semble à elle synthétiser synthétiser tous les arguments en faveur de l'attribution d'une valence positive au Maul Beerbaum. « Du darfst mich mit Schnee bewerten, ich komme mit sieben Blättern, vom sieben Stamm. » Il transparaissait le, à la fois le nom de Mandelstamm et la menorah, hein, « sieben Blöchter. Hein. » Mais il se trouve que cette version est barrée, fait suffisamment rare pour être souligné. Que signifie cette bifure Curieusement, toi, n'en a pas tiré argument pour sa lecture. Le poète en bon sériciculteur n'élève-t-il pas sa façon des vers à soi Ou, selon une métaphore à la star du mûrier, ne produit-il pas sans cesse de nouvelles feuilles On pourrait alors lire 
derrière Jüngstes Blatt, à la fin du poème, non seulement Jüngstes Gericht, jugement dernier comme le fait toi, mais aussi tenant compte de l'évidente performativité de l'ouverture d'Artenwende, Jüngstes Gedicht, dernier poème, poème le plus récent, et qui se promet un avenir fait de feuilles. Sous forme d'apostille à l'essai de Derrida, et selon, un tour, et selon un tour très solennien, je reviens pour conclure sur le tercet à la fin d'Archen Glory, cité au commencement. « Niemand zeugt für den Zeug. » Étrangement, Derrida ne mentionne pas cette autre lecture possible selon laquelle « niemand » ne serait pas un pronom indéfini, mais un substantif. « Niemand » avec majuscule. L'auteur de « Die Niemandsrose » n'a bien sûr pas manqué de lire et relire le chant neuf de l'Odyssée dans lequel Ulysse, au mille tours, se sert du pseudonyme Outis pour échapper à la cruauté de ce monstre nazi avant l'heure qu'est le cyclope polyphème. Outis emoi go onoma, mon nom est personne. Personne est le nom, en creux, du grand témoin, qui en définitive témoigne pour le témoin, celui qui occupe la place qui était dans un autre temps dévolu à Dieu et que la catastrophe juive a réduit à l'inexistence. who is coming from the University of Sheffield and uh, uh, his talk great to be here and um, to follow that really fascinating talk. Um, I'm going to talk about Salan's influence in a tentative sort of a way. Um, his influence as a poet of testimony but also a poet of language. Um, poetry is testimony to borrow Anthony Rowland's phrase. So I suppose what we can say about the influences is, is that people of either, other writers have either adopted Salan's style and significance for the testimonial aspects or for its self-consciousness about language, or a bit of both. Um, critical estimates on the poets who have influenced Salan are usually said to include, and we've heard about some of these, the French surrealists Mandelstam, Rilke and others. But there's less written about Salan's influence on other poets. Though when I was talking to a colleague about this, they said it was actually hard to think of somebody who hasn't been influenced by Salan. And as we continue to talk about that topic, all the examples that he was able to give were of male poets, which was also interesting. And what does the evidence of this effect reveal about Salan's poetry in turn? Can we see the tracing of such influence on other or successive generations as poets as a two-way, or even what Mikhail Bakhtin would call a dialogic process. Yes, thank you, you knew. Um, my first example, and they're not in chronological order, is that of the so-called Hiroshima poet, Araki Yasusada. Um, and we've heard a bit from um, Badieu, who's talked about plagiarism and false plagiarism. And this is a sort of example of both of those things. For those of you who don't know, Yasusada's work appeared in both Stand magazine in the UK and American Poetry Review in 1996, entitled Doubled Flowering from the Notebooks of Araki Yasusada. This was the fullest and most high profile appearance of Yasusada's work, which eventually precipitated its exposure. Although Yasusada's poetry and the biographical material, the notebooks, accompanying it suggested that he was an eyewitness of Hiroshima and the atomic blast. 
His work has been shown to be an elaborate hoax of a kind that we might think of as an, an entrapment hoax because you're supposed to work out that it's not real, whatever that means where poetry is concerned. So Yasusada never existed and his poetry is either a fabrication or a composition, one with attributional indeterminacy, as it's been called, but was most likely written by a Spanish instructor and American poet who works at Illinois called Kent Johnson, who had described himself up till then as the translator from Japanese. As one critic claims, the Yasusada project's constructions, consisting of both the poetry and the poet's biographical writings, are far more interesting, full of brilliant details, when they're known to be invented. Thus, the biographical features that appear to be extra diegetic errors, the clues that show us that Yasusada could never have existed, turn into fictive tropes. So it's as if the whole production of this figure is itself either a poetic or even a novelistic construction. Such invented details include those of the poems themselves and also of Yasusada's life and the poets who are said to have influenced him, one of whom is Paul Celan. As Marjorie Perloff has pointed out, this claim in the context of Yasusada's biography is an impossibility. It's one of the self-advertising anachronisms, or possibly we could call it a prochronism, in the sense of an event that is placed too early, that characterize his work. Perloff observes that the translators in American Poetry Review further comment that there are undated haiku that unmistakably bear the stamp of the famous poet and Holocaust survivor, Paul Celan, whose work was read by the Layered Clouds Poetry Group and critically discussed, critically discussed by them. Um, actually, you can still go back. Yes, thank you. Um, so she concludes that Paul Celan, ostensibly read and studied by the Soon group before World War II, did not start publishing, and then in German, until 1952. So the notion that he was closely studied in the Japan of the 30s is totally absurd. Or, in other words, a clue. In this sense, we could say, perhaps, that Celan's name here is the signifier of Yasusada's false status as a witness poet. But this doesn't mean that Salan's influence on the writing itself is not genuine, nor in some sense that it isn't witness poetry, even or especially if this work is fictive or performative. We might wonder what are the undated haiku to which the note refers, and if the aesthetic or mock hoax which the Yasusada project represents extends so far that they exist too. So the biographical note said that there were some other haiku that seemed very Salan-like, and actually in the collection that's since been published of Yasusada's work, there are some undated haiku which seem to me exactly to bear the influence of Salan. And here are two of the possible candidates from the collection doubled flowering. Um, and obviously when we read this in the knowledge that Yasusada never existed, they might seem overly artificial, but I'll be interested to know what you think. The first one. Tirelessly, tirelessly, moon is breathing, mountainside lakes birth. And the second one, similarly undated, and as we've just heard about Salan's meticulous dating, maybe again this is another clue to the kind of free-floating nature of this material. In the temple's silence, shaped like a hammer, the hammer's silence. Yasusada seems to have taken from Salan's example the notion of the poet as a retrospective eyewitness to atrocity, but also one who's still witnessing in the present. Also, his allegiance to and self-consciousness about his national language, and the incorporation of specific and often fleeting or gnomic cultural detail and location. Just as critics have read Salan's biography in refracted form into his poetry, and as we just heard, Salan claimed that his poem Death Fugue was his mother's epitaph and also gravestone. So the details of Yasusada's constructed life 
appear obliquely in his often dreamlike elegies. The uncanny imagery of women's hair in Death Fugue, invoked in relation to Jewish and German history through the figures of Shulamit and Margareta, reappears in Yasusada's poem, which you can see a bit of on the slide here, Mad Daughter and Big Bang. This is my favorite of all his poems. It seems, even as, a, as it were, a staged representation, a really fabulous poetic account of a speaker's bereavement and grief. It's the representation of a father driven to hallucination by that grief. It opens, setting the scene in the present. Walking in the vegetable patch late at night, I was startled to find the severed head of my mad daughter lying on the ground. From a distance, it had appeared to be a stone, haloed with light, as if cast there by the Big Bang. After a bad-tempered exchange that the rest of the poem continues, the father says, you look ridiculous, and the daughter replies, some boys buried me here, which is, in a historical sense, quite true. We then read, her dark hair, comet-like, trailed behind. By contrast to Celan's invocation of the Bible and German history, and German literary history, Yasusada calls on the history of the cosmos in his use of, again, of a woman's hair. The Big Bang is both the atomic blast and, by means of another anachronism on the part of his fabricators, the creation of the universe. The conversational address here, alongside a surreal register, might remind us both of Celan's forebears but equally compellingly of Sylvia Plath, or even as Salan as mediated by Sylvia Plath, as we see in the reappearance of the confusion of subjects with objects, even using the same vocabulary. Um, and the poem by this Yasusada poet ends, squatting, I pulled the turnip up by the root. So we discover that the turnip in the poem is the vegetable that the father mistook for his daughter because grief is so much in his mind, he can only see it in that way. In Plath's poem, Your, which you can see on the slide as a reminder, the child is described in a simile, rather than a complete correspondence, as in Yasutada's poem, as mute as a turnip, by contrast to the all too vocal category mistake that we encounter in Yasusada. So following on from this, my next example, briefly, is that of Plath herself. Anthony Rowland claims that Salan couldn't have influenced Plath's famous camp poems as his work hadn't been translated into English by then. So again, there's the same kind of slippage that we've just seen in relation to Yasusada. Rowland continues, Plath may have read him in the original German, but her command of the language, in her own words, wasn't great. Rowland says the same about Adorno, whose proscription of poetry is often linked Prochronistically with Salan's death fugue. On the other hand, Matthew Boswell, who fabulously is here in person, has argued convincingly for an indebtedness on Plath's part to Salan. And I must say that whenever I read particular of Plath's poems, it's, it is very hard not to see them as in some way a homage to Salan, as well as other Holocaust poets such as Nellie Sachs. And he traces again a debt in relation to the signification of women's hair both as a historical and as a more literary concept. The repeated invocation of the golden-haired Margareta and the ashen-haired Shulamit in Death Fugue reappears, as Boswell observes, at the conclusion of Plas Lady Lazarus, where a third kind of hair color is present. The speaker says, out of the ash I rise with my red hair and I eat men like air. Could we equally see Salan's careful construction as death, as a master from Germany, invoking carefully the notion of the skilled craftsman or Meister, that mythic and everyday figure, in Plath's metonymies for a dreadful father, the pantsman devil with an Aryan eye and moustache. Her use of the idea of poetic, repeated poetic melodies, alluded to in the title of her poem Little Fugue, seems to shade also into the psychological meaning of fugue, of course raised initially by Salan, as a form of amnesia or dissociative reaction to shock or emotional stress. 
bringing together, as is also the case in Death Fugue, the musical and psych psychoanalytic forms of memory and forgetting. Oh, thank you, you've anticipated me, that's fabulous. The influence of Salan on another poet, Kieran Carson, has an analogous emphasis in relation to the construction of memory within a political context. Some of you will obviously be familiar with this work. In an interview, Carson argues that Salan uses language to go beyond language or beyond our normal understanding of it. So interestingly there, he does focus on Salan as a language poet, but actually his Salan's influence on Carson is equally testimonial. The Irish poet named his 2008 collection For All We Know, which is, as you, if you think about it, an interesting, ambiguous phrase suggesting both lack of knowledge, for all we know there might be an influence, with its totality, for all we know. Um, this is named after Salan's 1963 poem, So Many Constellations. Carson's collection of sonnets follows the doomed love of a couple set against various European locations, including Dresden, Berlin, and also the 1970s Belfast of the era of the Troubles, at the end of which the loved one, Nina, is killed in a car crash. And when I was thinking about this, it seemed to me to establish possibly an implicit parallel with a version of Salan's own personal losses, um, particularly perhaps of Ingeborg Bachmann, though he obviously died first. The form of Carson's For All We Know establishes what critics have called a fugal memory of repeated details and locations in the poetry itself. In this way, the biographical likeness in Carson's collection, and he establishes a link between himself, even his name, sounds a little bit like Salant. Um, this biographical likeness actually stands for a more poetic and buried one. Significantly, in this context of love and loss between two people, Salan's poem, which inspired it, suggests the importance of two subjectivities for the sharing of knowledge. Um, and there's a, a quotation of it there. If you could just go back again briefly, thank you very much. Um, and just to remind you of this poem um, by Salan, I know and you know, we knew we did not know. We were there after all and not there. And at times when only the void stood between us, we got all the way to each other. The reference here are quite overdetermined about a sharing of knowledge of an absent presence. Um, and as Alexandra Eremiria er er puts it, they could be quite specific. We might be tempted to read this scenario and its apparent reference to the past in relation to a personal we and also to a historical there and not there, the witness who was sort of on the periphery of events and wasn't really in their midst. But in fact, the poem seems to be more about memory in a more general sense, acknowledging the fact that in Edward Casey's phrase, remembering transforms one kind of experience into another, so to be there and not there is true of any kind of remembering. In being remembered, an experience becomes a different kind of experience. So rather than being locked in the past, what the witness testifies to is something in the present. Carson's sequence is also about memory and its impossibility in relation both to historical events and to his dead lover. As the poetic speaker concludes, so I return to the question of those staggered repeats as my memories of you recede into the future that seems um, a great way to, as it were, implicitly interpret Salan, memories which recede into the future. In one of the sonnets from For All We Know, thank you very much, um, Carson performs a double citation, so it's as if he's become very self-conscious of his own having been influenced by Salan, invoking a poem by Salan in which the earlier poet himself quotes an anterior writer, in this case Bertolt Brecht. Um, in a phrase by Brecht, which has been very widely quoted and reinterpreted. Brecht's To Those Born Later, which was itself published 30 years earlier, asks, what kind of times are they when a talk about trees is almost a crime because it implies silence about so many horrors? Um, and here is Salan's poem, a leaf 
treeless for Bertolt Brecht. What times are these when a conversation is nearly a crime? Because it includes so much being spoken. Um, there are different translations of that poem, particularly the last lines. And Carson, in his version of this called Peace, has gone for a slightly different version. So Carson reinterprets Brecht by a Salan. What kinds of times are these, you'd say, when a conversation is deemed a crime because it includes so much that is said? Um, John Clegg calls this a translation on Carson's part, and one which is fairly close. But actually, the little tiny differences between Carson and Salan are themselves quite significant. The lineation seems deliberately different. It's almost like free verse or even conversational. And there's the crucial addition of you'd say, um, and in the poem by Carson, because of the constant presence of Nina, the other person, it's as if that's what Nina used to say. Um, while nearly a crime, the phrase that Salan uses, becomes is deemed a crime. Um, and you could either see that as something that's in popular knowledge, people have said that it is a crime, or even something that is officially legal. It's as if Carson is seeing the Irish peace post process via East European and wartime history. And he includes the idea of an interlocutor, you, and the malign process of law itself. It is deemed. So the madness is extended even to what is judged to be legal. Carson might be perhaps a surprising successor to Salat, but there are others who are much more well known, I suppose, um, and again, quite explicit about that reference. Geoffrey Hill's poetry, draws on the earlier poet, does refer to him explicitly in the poetry itself. Thank you. Oh, no, do I have a few? Oh, no, sorry, there is no slide. That's a strange gap on my part, but thank you. Anyway, I'm just going to read it out. Um, Salam, uh, in Hill's collection, The Orchards of Sion of 2002, Salan's name is cited in six of the poems, while the earlier Tenebrae of 1978, itself named after a poem, Salan's, in which Hill produces a free translation of two of Salan's poems from Die Niemans Rosa, called Two Choral Preludes, subtitled On Melodies by Paul Salan, which have been called a double elegy for the older poet. Um, one of the three translations, I'm afraid I'm going to have to read it to you because somehow I forgot to put it on the slide, um, is Salan's poem, Ice Eden. In this poem, set in a lost realm, we see an, a kind of world of childlike vision within which we perceive an icy threat. Um, and this is Salan's poem, which I'll just read briefly. There is a lost land where a moon grows in the marsh, and that which froze there with us glows around and sees, it sees, for it has eyes which are bright earths, the night, the night, the lies. It sees, the eye child sees. It sees, it sees, we see. I see you, you see. The ice will rise from the dead before the hour closes. Obviously that's really fabulous and something that clearly attracted Hill's attention. But his version, again, translates and interprets at the same time, becoming what one critic calls imitations of the originals, as can be seen in the first stanza. Um, and I hope if I read out these first few lines of Hill's imitation, you'll be able to think what he's done to Salan's original, if it is an original. There is a land called Lost, at peace inside our heads. The moon, full on the frost, vivifies those stone heads. So where Salan has, there is a lost land, Hill has, there is a land called lost, personifying the land and making the fairy tale element and the next idea, that of an inner world, much more prominent and more concrete. Um, Hill continues, there is a land called lost at peace inside our heads. So he makes the fact that this is an inner world much more explicit. But it's as if the German capitalization prompted the idea, and that's interesting because of what we just heard about a possible ambiguity because of German capitalization. Um, because the first line in Salan's original reads, es ist ein Land verloren, 
could you say that Falora in there could be a noun? So if Hill has interpreted, or if the speaker of his poem has interpreted it in, it in that way, it might be positing that there is a land called lost is actually a better translation than there is a lost land. In this free translation, the transformation of a poet's work is a kind of super influence or the effort perhaps to subsume the earlier voice into the present writers. Um, and it's obviously quite a common strategy. Simon Armitage has done so with Pearl from early English and Ted Hughes has done it with Ovid and Janosz Pilinski, um, where somebody else produced a literal translation and then the later poet produced their own version. Inspired in turn by what she calls Hill's transductions of Silan, so again there's a kind of a triple influence here, um, the US poet Courtney Drews has produced a series of three, three translations or artworks. I, again, maybe I weirdly forgot to put, they're not there either, never mind, I shall read them out to you. Um, she has produced a series of three, three translations or artworks responding to some of Solan's poems from Atem Venda of 1967, which she calls Notes on Some Sculptures by Paul Solan, which is quite an interesting use of that word, as if she sees them as um, objects rather than poems. Um, and again, I'll just read you out the Solan example, which is Thread Sons, and there's a whole series of these by Courtney Drews. You can look them up online if you want to do that. Um, so Solan's original, Thread Sons, above the gray black wilderness, a tree high thought tunes into light's pitch. There are still songs to be sung on the other side of mankind. Um, and Courtney Drews's version of this again changes the lineation of the poem, um, which seems to be very meticulously and cleverly set up in Solan's original, but she's kind of explicitly changed that. So her reversion again is called Thread Sons, and Courtney Drews's speaker writes, the tree on fire throws out its filaments, weaves them to an orb with all eight branches to keep you out. What we see seems a chrysalis, lanterning a pulsing light. Um, and there are very interesting, I think, moments of translation in the act of translating and interpreting there. Uh, the tree on fire throws out its filaments from Druz is an interpretation of what thread suns itself might mean some critics have suggested it means a very fa faint and pale version of the sun. Um, for Druze it means it's filaments, it's on fire. Weaves them to an orb with all eight branches. That's not really explicitly present in what Salam writes. But again, it might conjure up that notion of the menorah with its own branches that we've heard about already. Um, and Salam's ideas of songs beyond humankind the, the lines from Solana on the other side of mankind remains in Drizzy's version, although her use of personal pronouns, she uses we and you, and the transformation of tree high thought into a more literal kind of tree makes the poem less abstract. And again, we've seen that there's a site of poetic debate about the whole notion of the tree in Solana's writing. Um, and Drizzy's version also loses the musical hint from Solana. Um, where he writes, the tree high thought tunes in to light's pitch. So there's a kind of deliberate reference to musicality there. Um, but she has suggested that there's nothing like that. It's much more visual. So where Salan emphasizes the aural, she emphasizes the oral. So to conclude, perhaps it's the case that any consideration of influence will always be dialogic in the sense that it draws attention back to what later poets have detected and valued in the original writer's work. And I think you can see that throughout Hill, Carson, Drews, and all the other examples, and Plath. The kinds of mode adopted from Salan's writing include literary music, fugal memory, the idea of a fugue itself, eyewitness poetry, politics, home, literary, and mythical or mystical history. As is often the case, it can seem as if an influence is present in a variety of ways, including that of its being impossible definitively to demonstrate it, and that's definitely the case, the feeling that I have both with Yasusada and with Plath. There are other poets I haven't mentioned who have 
explicitly or implicitly claimed Salam's work as a precedent. In the case, for instance, of the American writer Eric Pankey and also Charles Wright, or to have allowed this to be perceived in the example of the British poet J. H. Prynne and the artists Anselm Kiefer and even the ceramicist Edmund Duval, um, by their adoption of Salam's concerns and phrasing. And there are other poets again, Pierre Joris, who Badieu has um, mentioned as a translator, Jerome Rothenberg and Douglas Oliver. The ones I've mentioned have been only anglophone writers. In some cases, such as Hill, have even been described as peculiarly British, but have adopted Salan's much more European or world perspective. But we might also consider such Romanian writers as the poet Greta Tartler, who's spoken about Salan's influence on her in a British context. In relation to Ingeborg Bachmann, the correspondence in every sense between the two poets is tantamount to a dialogue as much as dialogic, as is clear, for instance, in relation to Bachmann's response, and this is just one tiny example out of many, to Salan's poem In Egypt, which was explicitly written to her, with her poem Miriam, one of the figures named by Salan. Lastly, and there is a slide for this, I seem to have remembered to make one, um, the case of the Argentinian poet um, J.C. Bustriazo Ortiz has by contrast been examined by the critic Andres Ayens as an example of influence without historical basis, really overtly so. This line from the poet's 1972 poem in Cancion Rupestre could be an order or a supplication. Don't light the flower of extermination for me. And you can see why the critic would like to see Salan's influence there. On the other hand, it does seem too explicit. The word extermination doesn't really perhaps fit Salan's writing, though flower might do. Um, this critic, Arendt, asks, does this poem, Archaic Ballad, respond to, or perhaps correspond with, if there is no actual influence? Does it correspond with Paul Salan's D. Niemann's Rosa? As Arendt radically concludes, in a way that could free us from having to determine whether an apparent reference to Salan is deliberate, or if either Plath or the Asusada could read German, it is possible that one writing might correspond with another, that one and another writing might intermingle independently of the will of and the possible awareness of their signatories. Thank you. very nice and fluent uh, dialogue uh, of both, both Salan and uh, his readers and uh, other poets. Uh, I'm now inviting our guest from Finland, bearing witness one language to another is the title of the talk and uh, uh, please welcome Payari Eres. Bearing witness one language to another. Something seems conspicuously absent from my title. Someone, maybe an imagined proofreader, might suggest that we replace the dash between witness and one with the preposition from, and perhaps add quotation marks ar around witness so that we get bearing witness, bearing witness from one language to another. This could suggest that we pay attention to differences in the vocabularies of testimony in different idioms, even when they seem quite similar, as in bearing witness versus se porter témoin or porter témoignage. The French word for witness, témoin, and the English, English verb testify and its cognates come from the Latin testis, which etymolo etymologically refers to a third party standing by doubtlessly a third man. The Latin word testis means, of course, both witness and testicles. Reportedly, this strange etymological root of the witness comes from an ancient practice whose variants are known from many different cultures or ethnic groups of holding either one's own or some others, sometimes an animal's, 
testicles in one's hand while swearing an oath. This gesture or rite could probably be translated into the idea of swearing by one's progeny. If I commit perjury, let my branch wither. So it is in the name of the future other, or perhaps the continuity of the same, the same patrilineal lineage that I swear to tell the tr truth. Let it be mentioned that a similar association seems also present in German, since the verb Deugen means both to testify and to procreate. Uh, the etymological connection is, is, is um, rather obscure. The presence of the third party in scenes of testimony provides, of course, the primary modern meaning of the English word witness. A witness is one present as a spectator or auditor, namely a third party able, able to represent, to recreate the scene he or she witnessed. But obsolete and more word-for-word -word synonyms for the word witness given by the Oxford English Dictionary are knowledge, understanding, wisdom. The word witness is also applied uh, to the inward testimony of the conscience and an oath is traditionally signaled by the clause, as God is my witness. So, a witness is a third party or my interior knowledge of myself or the other who is perhaps even more intimate to me than myself. So either God, the absolute witness, this absolute witness is a quote from Derrida, uh, the, the absolute witness or one's conscience is not just called for help as in the formula used widely in the English speaking world, so help me God, but someone to witness for the witness. For Paul Celan's famous lines, Niemand zeugt für den Zeugen, no one bears witness for the witness, one interpreta interpretation could be perhaps that in the absence of witness, in the ab absence of witnesses, in the absence of survivors, and in the absence even of God, the absolute superstars, quoting Derrida again, in the absence of God, as the witness of all the witnesses who is summoned in the definite absence of witnesses of our survivors, no one remains to bear witness. In Paul Celan's poetry, testimony is thematized in numerous, perhaps even countless ways. I will mention a couple of examples as briefly as possible. Um, Radix Matrix is a poem that stands witness to the severe lineage of Abraham and Jesse, but also to the loss of the mother tongue, as Werner Hamacher has demonstrated. It bears witness not only to the severe lineage of witnesses, but also to the, to the imposs impossibility of witnessing without language, when also language has been murdered, severed, uprooted. The German language may be the privileged witness, to the atrocities, as Derrida maintains. It may be the victim of verbicide that happened together with the genocide, as Derrida has also suggested. And it may, yeah, and it may be the survivor of all the death-bringing speeches, as Paul Celan has himself affirmed. But it is also the language of the absence of witnesses. Todd Nauberg is a poem bearing witness to the encounter between uh, between Celan and Martin Heidegger. A poem about forgiveness, perhaps, and this is an infi infinitely complicated issue as such. But there is also a scene of witnessing to be recognized more or less openly in the poem. A third, a testis, who attested to a conversation during a drive, is mentioned. But before that, before the drive, the poem attests to a walk on the paths of the Black Forest village, Todd Nauberg, in the vicinity of Heidegger's famous cottage, Die Hütte. Several flowers are mentioned and all their names carry a world of connotations. One of the lines names Orchis und Orchis einzeln. Orchid and Orchid singly. The name Orchid, Orchis, uh, a Greek word used also in German. Orchis is a synonym, synonym of testis, also testicle, and this comes from the shape of the root bulbs of the plant. 
tuberoids. So it is perhaps not far-fetched to think of the two men, the poet and the thinker, both solitary and singular in their own way, Einzeln, both rooted in their own way. Even an uprooted is rooted in his own way. Both survivors and witnesses, Subestes and Testes, in their own way. If one uh, translates the Greek and the German, Orchis und Orchis, to Latin, one gets Testis et Testis. Beyond this darkly humorous allusion, this subterranean reference must be connected with other allusions uh, to the earth and what lies beneath. Axel Gelhaus uh, has pointed out the conspicuous absence of one element of the four in Heidegger's mirror play of the fourfold in Cella's poem, Todd Nauber. While earth, human beings and the sky are more or less directly brought to appear in the poem, the gods are replaced by the dead, buried beneath the soil. If you know the poem, Todd Nauber, uh, unfortunately I, I have no time to read it, read it though. Um, uh, discuss, or to discuss it in more, even more detail. Um, however, rather confirming this observation by Gellhaus, I have suggested that there is, um, there is in Todd Nauberg an intimation of the presence of, or conspicuous absence of the monotheistic God, and yet another allusion to testimony. There is reason to believe that the emphatic singling out of the word Hütte in the strophe in der Hütte, connected or contrasted with the words in das Buch, in dies Buch, could even allude to the word used in Luther's German, meaning tabernacle, the tabernacle of testimony. So read through the various layers and aspects, it may begin to occur that the third party attests to the event from each detail and every word of the poem Todd Nauber. Such concealed testimony is born from one language to another, or the idiom of another era or context can often be found, or at least suspected, in Paul Celan's poetry. I suggested in the beginning that the silent dash in my title could be re replaced with the pr preposition from. We could alternatively use another preposition of bearing witness of one language to another, and this version could apply to such cases where the vocabulary contains encrypted pieces of testimony from, as in the cases already mentioned, Latin, or sometimes from Yiddish, for example. Among Cella's poems, Du Liegst, is one that famously underwent complete deciphering, as Philippe Lacoulabach has characterized Peter Zondi's uh, essay, Eden, where Zondi comes forth as one of the friends who accompanied the poet during his stay in Berlin just before Christmas in 1967, and who was thus able to relate more or less um, every detail, every verse in the poem to the places Ceylan visited and, and a book he read during his visit. Zondi was indeed the privileged witness but the poem relates to witnessing in another very concrete sense too. The book Ceylon was reading reported uh, the court testimonies of the Freikorps uh, soldiers who were present at the murders of Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht in 1919. Extracts from these testimonies are present in the poem almost as such, only adjusted to the metrical schema. Der Mann wacht zum Sieb, the man turned to a sieb, refers to Liebknecht being shot. Die Frau musste schwimmen, die Sau, the lady had to swim, the Sau, to uh, Rosa Luxemburg's lifeless body thrown into the Landwehrkanal. She had to swim für sich, für keinen, für jeden, namely for herself, for no one, for everyone. The testimonies that turn the human into a lifeless object, a sieve, or an animal, a slaughtered animal, a sow, are contrasted with this martyrdom for herself, for no one, for everyone. 
with the dash, my title bearing witness, one language to another, someone's language to stand witness. One language is born to another, to another carried over, übergetragen, as it is said in German, to another as a witness. Translation of a foreign language is an act of testimony. A translator is a third between us and the language we do not have direct access to. It is not just a word and another that we need to find an equivalent for, but another world, not just a word, but another world that needs to be carried over. And this is why a translation should perhaps not pretend to make everything familiar, to smooth out the differences as if they never existed, or to familiarize the uncanniness, the original Unheimlichkeit that we encounter that I encounter singled out when someone addresses me in a language that I do not understand at all. All right, um, I will I will turn to 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 text uh, um, where Jacques Derrida reads reads Rosalan uh, and. And especially uh, his uh, memorial speech for Hans Georg Gadamer. Just as in Demeure and Poetics and Politics of Witnessing, that evoke the final three lines of the poem Aschenglory, Niemand zeugt für den Zeugen, no one bears witness for the witness, also in his memorial speech for Hans Georg Gadamer. Published, published as the book Bélier and translated at, as Ram's unin, un, uninterrupted dialogue between two infinities, the poem. Jacques Derrida pays very specific attention to the envoi, envoy of the poem, Grosse Glühende Wölbung. This time, the last verse, Die Welt ist fort, dich muss dich tragen. The world is gone, I must carry you. This is the poem uh, you see projected now on the canvas. Also, Rams is about bearing witness, a testimony on testimony. It is, among many other things, about poetry and language too, and, uh, and about translation, about remembrance and fidelity as well. Will I be able to bear witness, Derrida asks, to begin his speech, in, just, in a just and faithful fashion to my admiration for Hans Georg Gadamer. But my reason uh, to discuss the poem and Derrida's reading is not this more or less occasional, apparently incidental connection to the theme of tes testimony, but rather, rather what could be called the egology and alteriology of witnessing. Namely, the notion of witness that implies oneself the other and the third. There's not, not enough time now to discuss the poem, in, the poem as a whole and in detail, so I will more or less make a shortcut to the last line, the envoy, the one that should actually invite us to turn back and read over. All the agitated, perhaps violent movements in the poem the swarming and the burrowing towards the glowing vault and perhaps out of it, the engraving by branding, branding, the swelling of the marrow of the coagulated hard oceans, the rams charging against everything and everyone in the world, as Derrida suggests, is suddenly stopped or replaced by a very different kind of movement, a movement of carrying, bearing the other in the absence of the world. Die Welt ist fort, ich muss dich tragen. It is as if the strange, uncanny, perhaps nightmarish world or counter world of the Schwarzgestirn, Schwarm, a very German word indeed, and the coagulated heart oceans with their swelling marrow, all the agitation and inversions black stars swarming against the glowing vault, an image that seems like a negative of a starry sky, etc. A world of apocalyptic disorder. It is, it is as if this world 
suddenly receded just before the last, the final line. When the world has surpassed all nightmares in horror or absurdity to the point that the Cartesian doubt about it being just a simulacrum has become more pressing than ever, also the necessity to bear witness to the other, for the other, becomes more pregnant than ever. In the beautiful final chapter of the beautiful book Bélier, Rams Derrida invites us to focus on two words of the line Die Welt ist fort, ich muss dich tragen. The verb tragen and the noun Welt. First of all, Derrida considers two possible meanings of the verb tragen in this context. It could refer to bearing a child as well as bearing sorrow at heart, bearing the future as well as the past. Not only to someone who mourns, but also to a mother bearing a child, die Welt ist fort, the world is far apart. Indeed, if we look back at the poem as a whole, we might have to concede that we do not know whether the agitated motions, the pushing and the swelling and so on, belong to the prenatal state, the state of being born, or being in agony, in extremis, whether these movements precede the beginning or the end of the world. These two possibilities are in connection with three ways of thinking the world and its being departed or being apart, being far apart. And these three ways of thinking are related to three major thinkers, to the, uh, three major thinkers of the 20th century, namely Freud, Heidegger and Husserl in uh, Derrida's reading. Derrida's, uh, Derrida's uh, choice of these three pop proper names is in no way arbitrary or far-fetched, I would say. First of all, because these three cannot be just ignored when we are faced with the absence of a world or the world, be it in a verse of a poem. And secondly, we know that uh, Paul Celan read all these uh, three intensively and extensively, and all of these proper names are present as more or less obvious points of reference, even citations in his poetry and prose. Uh, Freud is among these three, and I quote Derrida, both because of the allusion made to mourning and melancholy, and in order to remove the analysis, albeit interminable, from the order of consciousness, from self-presence, and from the ego, from all egology. This is a necessary precaution before the two phenomenologists, Husserl and Heidegger, are summoned. Heidegger, due to the importance of the two words and concepts mentioned, Welt and Tragen, in his thinking, and Husserl, due to the phenomenological method of epoche, or Weltvernichtung, the methodi methodical annihilation of the world in the transcendental <laughs> reduction. I will not discuss Heidegger this time, uh, but would like to follow Derrida to the, to the end of the world, the Weltvernichtung, the annihilation, epoche or suspension of the world in Husserl's uh, tra transcendental phenomenology. Derrida always returned to this border region, the intra-phenomenological limit that traverses the very core of Husserlian phenomenology. Always, that is from such works in the early 60s as Violence et Metaphysique, where he challenges Levinas's objection to Husserl's notion of the alter ego, to this uh, other way, to this memorial speech for Hans-Georg Gadamer in 2003. Transcendental reduction requires the methodical suspension of the reality of the ex exterior world and its objects in order to arrive at the, constitution of mean, uh, at the constitution or meaning of the objects and the world for the transcendental ego, a process of which Husserl uses the striking word Weltvernichtung, annihilation of the world. In the encounter with the other, uh, uh, in the encounter with the other eye, this epoch confronts a great challenge. In the absolute solitude of the pure ego, another eye, alter ego, whose meaning must still be constituted in the realm of the pure ego, cannot be accessed in an original intuition in the same way as 
worldly objects, exterior objects are. This is what Husserl has to admit in his, uh, admit in his fifth Cartesian meditation, as Derrida insists. As what, is essentially, as what it essentially is and means, namely as another subject or another origin of the world, the alter ego is constituted for me only analogically, through appresentation, as Husserl says, only indirectly. Not perceived, but apperceived. Not presented, but apresented. Uh, indirect intentional mediation is required, as Husserl says. And as Derrida says with regard to Celan's verse, Die Welt ist fort, ich muss dich tragen. It is my responsibility to bring the other to the realm in which the world withdraws, to carry the other into this sphere of the pure ego, or carry myself toward the other as other. This carrying of the other to the other or for the other can be neither appropriation nor comprehension in the strict sense of this term, but it must be, so to say, running to meet the other, a movement of conveying oneself toward the infinite inappropriability and incommensurability of the other, toward the other's absolute transcendence, even when the, when the other is within my sphere, within me, without me. And it is precisely a question of translation here, of translating what is absolutely exterior to me in my, um, into my interior, to my innermost core. But even before that, my turning inside out, an exposure to the other as my responsibility to turn or translate the absolutely exterior into my interior, so that it remains other and untranslatable. Do I still have five minutes? In Derrida's critic of Levinas in 1964, Husserl's phenomenological analysis of the alter ego was shown to be absolutely indispensable, something without which it would be impossible to speak of the other person, autrui and of ethics. Refusing this structure of the alter ego would deprive us of the very language by which we would formulate an ethics of alterity. So we need egology to, to, to have an alteriology. The phenomenon of the alter ego indicates another origin of the world. The other's phenomenality is the per perceivable face or aspect of an irreducibly uh, of an irreducible uh, non-phenomenality or the analogically apperceptible reference point of the other as an absolute origin. It is evident, writes Derrida in Violence et Metaphysique, Violence and Metaphysics, four decades before Bellier, it is evident by an essential, absolute and definitive self-evidence that the other, as transcendental other, other absolute origin and other zero point of the orientation of the world, can never be given to me in an original way and in person, but only through analogical representation. Uh, that was a quote from, from, from uh, Derrida's critique of, of Levinas, uh, early, early Levinas. To put it another way, briefly, I cannot take the other's place in space and time, and this is something I must acknowledge. But, but it's, it's also my responsibility to, to, to try that, in a way. Empathy is the word for, for this necessity. The necessity of the impossibility of all. taking the place of the other. I must bear the other, the other I, the other conscience or consciousness, the other origin of the world into the sphere of my ego, not as an object or even as a subject identical to mine, but as irreducibly other. This happens through analogy. The analogical apresentation or apperception cannot be an appropriation or comprehension or totalization. Tout autre est tout autre. Every other is wholly other. Even when we reach out toward the other, to apprehend the other through an analogical apresentation that retains 
the otherness of the other. Tout autre et tout autre, this formula, uh, this Derrida's formula that can be, uh, could be translated in numerous ways. There is no ethics, there is no responsibility without the transcendental responsibility involved in the analogical representation of the alter ego, namely the ethical or pre-ethical obligation to carry the other into the sphere where the transcendent world has withdrawn, to carry you into my sphere, the realm of the pure ego. Derrida never abandon, abandons the Husserlian analysis of representation even when he shifts the emphasis from the I am toward the I must, from the sum and the cogito, towards the debt to the other and the original responsibility. So the Husserlian notion of apresentation remains indispensable in thinking alterity and egoity, an egoity which means also my alterity with respect to the others than me. Analogical apperception is neither an inference by analogy nor a metaphorical representation. Heuristically, it might be worthwhile to mention that in theology, the notion of analogy has been used to explain the infinite difference between divine attributes and their human counterparts. Distance instead of familiar, familiarization or approximation. What is true about the phenomenality of the other's body as an indication of incommensurability is true also about the body of a poem in his notes written during composing the Buchner Prize speech of 1960, perhaps best known by its title, The Meridian, Paul Celan insisted that the poetic image is something else than simple metaphor. Actually, he insists that poetry is anti-metaphorical. And this is due to its phenomenal character, writes Paul Celan. Against the extreme examples of violence and metaphor, metaphors of violence and violence through metaphor, such as the metamorphosis of a man into a sieve and of a woman into a sow. We have the obligation to study the other through a distant comprehension, as Paul Celan insisted. On the other hand, what is true about the phenomenality of the poem is true about the other. Every real-life encounter takes place in remembrance of the secret of the poem, says Paul Celan. Every true encounter bears witness to the secret of the poem. I must bear witness in the abs absence of witness to the absence of witness for the witness. Thank you. I'm struck, 
and I had, and my question is, are you not struck this way too? Uh, that Ceylon was quite reluctant about the notion of representations of uh, violation. That he had, I think that he has a rather reticent and delicate relationship to the notion of representation of atrocity. Uh, and I think, um, think of, I mean, what's clarifying uh, to me is that a contemporary of his American poet, Robert Lowell, he doesn't feel this at all. In Robert Lowell's poetry, there is a rather ample representation of historical experience. If all we knew of the Holocaust were what we could read from the poems of Paul Ceylon, I think we would not know very much. Uh, do you not find that striking? Thank you very much for your question. I, I suppose that it was addressed to our last speaker or to all speakers. Okay. So, yes. So I invite you to respond. Uh, I don't know if you. Well, that's um, a huge question. But the reason I was talking about Sherman yesterday, that it also depends on your theory of language. Is there some kinds of language use that do produce a testification to an event? When we talk about poetry, there are four. What do you say about the testimony within that legal context? Is we pass it because it's the same word as used, but it's maybe is it not quite the right usage? Is all poetry testimony, as the example of Robert Long suggests, to a kind of satisfies the truth, maybe? That's a very cool good answer. Mm, but I suppose, actually, the question is, the whole thing is always the idea of what is actually a question of the testimony of it. There are some, some documents or utterances that might seem to be others. I think not. So I, I suppose that's a very helpful answer, but it's the whole question of what we think language can do in reference to the real world and what we're testing it which is our topic. I'm not sorry. I think, um, well, well as, I, as, I, as I've just said, um, Gerald was, was um, reading court testimonies and citing them in, in his poems. I, I don't think he, he would, would have written, um, would have given, um, even not the notion of testi testifying, but, but he certainly problematized it in, in his poetry. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a huge question, as you said. So, no, I, I don't think he, he wanted to refute the adequacy of testimony in, in a, any simple way, even though he problematized it. Perhaps. Je sais que vous dire, si j'ai bien compris votre propos, que le mode indirect est absolument privilégié par ce mode. Il y a une impossibilité de la représentation, bien sûr, des faits. Et à la différence de la poésie de Nelly Sachs, par exemple, qui thématise l'horreur dans certains points, cela ne le fait jamais. Uh, I think I would like to say that the indirect uh, modality of testifying uh, is something that, as I understood well, was at stake here. And comparing to what uh, Paul Celan uh, was doing, comparing to uh, Nelly Sachs and her poetry, uh, who was much more testifying and uh, uh, thematizing the horror in itself, uh, Paul Celan did something else. Euh, il y a une analogie que je fais souvent avec les propos que tient Claude Lanzmann dans son autobiographie intitulée Le lièvre de Patagonie. So there, there is an analogy uh, in uh, uh, Lanzmann's, Claude Lanzmann's, uh, the, the author of the Shoah uh, autobiography. Uh, uh, the, 
le lièvre de Patagonie. The, the, the Patagonian uh, 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 bear, yeah. Hair. Hair. Yeah. That's right. Et dans ce, dans ce livre, euh, Lanzmann écrit, cette, pose ce problème de l'impossibilité. Dans le film Shoah, rien n'est montré. Tout est joué. Et tout se passe dans la parole et dans l'impossibilité de représenter. So the, 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 the very thing that we had in the film Shoah is that nothing has been represented. Everything was played. And That's what, that was, uh, at stake. On sait qu'il s'est refusé à utiliser la moindre image, y compris les fameuses images commentées par euh, Huberman, euh, les seules images yes. qu'on ait euh, véritablement prises dans un camp pendant l'horreur. So we, we, it's, it's very well known that Claude Lanzmann refused to take any uh, photographs or any material, documented material, and uh, it's well known uh, the debate with the Uh, Uberman, who uh, also made a huge book uh, on uh, uh, survive, uh, survival image uh, about uh, a few uh, cliches, photographic cliches of uh, taken uh, in, uh, in concentration camps, uh, or quatre uh, photographs. Et pour terminer, en accord avec mon collègue britannique qui vient de parler, euh, je dirais que. Euh, il y a toujours euh, une, 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 un mode indirect, une, une impossibilité. Le poème témoigne chaque fois de quelque chose qui ne peut pas être dit de façon directe. Et le travail de celui qui l'interprète est précisément à la recherche de, euh, de cela, que lui-même ne va pas pouvoir dire de façon euh, plus, plus, plus directe. So This is why we have poetry, actually, because the uh, poetic language uh, says and talks to us uh, something which is indirect and uh, which actually could be said only through uh, this, uh, uh, this channel of poetic language. Just this phrase de, de, que selon a sans doute emprunté à Michel de Guy, ou poète français Michel de Guy, euh, je l'ai rencontré récemment, il m'a dit que c'est possible. Cela en dit, et c'est fondamental, euh, la poésie déjoue l'image. La poésie déjoue l'image. So, uh, the French poet uh, de Guy, uh, who uh, painted Paul Zelon, uh, and uh, uh, Professor Badiou uh, met him recently and they discussed about this, that actually uh, Zelan uh, borrowed from uh, de Guy uh, this, uh, uh, the, 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 the expression that actually uh, uh, The, the poetic, the uh, des jours, on the plays and uh, can you help me? Do, who is undoes uh, undoes uh, the, uh, the 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 image? Yes, please. Yes, please. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name right. Hi. Do you feel that what is, um, what is being represented as Lanzmann's position is contrary to the etymology that you presented, that is the figure of the adequacy of the representation of the hand on your testicles sort of thing. This is, I mean, this seems to be directly a, a paradox between the two. Do you not feel this? I, I ask this not, not to ask this in order to get clear myself as to whether the notion of testimony is not deeply paradoxical and in some at some points we're working with at some points we would speak of the impossibility, which would be an, which such speaking would be an abomination to people who come forward with testimony and say, this happened to me, I saw this happen, I was there. How dare you say it is impossible to represent this? Uh, that's, that's what I'm, I'm sensitive to. Uh, maybe I'll pass, pass the, uh, the to someone else if, if someone else would like to. Yeah. 
Yes. May, may I? Why? Yeah. May I? It, it was, uh, I was very uh, receptive to what you were talking. And actually, I had this uh, also, uh, the, the uh, background picture of uh, what we are living in now with uh, all this uh, uh, astonishing uh, um, things about uh, testifying something that had happened 30, 40 years ago. And uh, uh, it's not a uh, coincidence that uh, you were supposed to take the testicles and it's a very masculine thing. And uh, I can read in this uh, uh, some of this uh, um, sexual difference uh, uh, directly uh, by saying that uh, and from time to time I have an impression that Paul Talon uh, is uh, also Shulamiti uh, or his mother's voice, he's like it's channeling it's his uh, women's uh, uh, echoing that impossibility of representing, talking something which was not there even in the testimony. So even in those testicles. So the, the, the possibility of speak up something not even representable is uh, there uh, with this significance of a feminine, of, of uh, uh, the eternal absent, even in uh, uh, even in Judaism or any other monotheism uh, whatsoever. So, um, and uh, that was uh, also my question to uh, uh, Noah and uh, testimonies that uh, they collected. Uh, what about female voices? Uh, and what about the difference between those who testified uh, from within their masculinity and uh, presence in the war, doesn't matter on which side, uh, and other voices. Because here uh, in this territory uh, on the Balkans, we do have a huge heritage of those uh, female uh, voices, unknown most often, uh, which testified with their bodies uh, and even after uh, they are gone, uh, still testifying. Je voudrais simplement dire que, oh, il faut revenir à la littéralité du poème. Orchis et Orchis, ce sont deux fleurs, deux orchidées que cela vient de reconnaître concrètement chez un grand connaisseur de botanique qui était à guerres. Orchis et Orchis. La désignation de l'une après l'autre est très importante. C'est la singularité de l'individu. Et je dirais, pour renchérir, que Orchis, c'est une fleur. Le féminin est là. Il est là. So, uh, the, the thing is that uh, Heidegger uh, had in front of him, when he received Zelon, two uh, orchidia, and then uh, uh, this Orchis is not only from the etymological point of view, uh, testicle, but also la fleur, uh, in French it's a feminine. And du blume. And of du the blume, uh, in, uh, and in, in, uh, in German as well. So uh, that way of translating, transposing from the concrete into language also yeah. made it la feminine. Phrase, la phrase est une extrême violente d'une extrême violence par rapport à Heidegger. This is very extremely violent against, que, que dit -il? against uh, il, dit, il dit cette fleur qui est testicule, cette fleur qui est la sexualité, qui est la reproduction, la possibilité de reproduire. Dans la lutte, en 29, a eu lieu une réunion qui était déjà tout à fait sous le sceau des SA. Eh bien, ce peuple, ce juif-là, ce juif-là, vous lui avez coupé les couilles vous l'avez émasculé, il ne pourra plus avoir d'enfant. Vous avez essayé d'éteindre la génération. Et la, et, le, et la désignation des deux est, est là aussi un acte qui, 
désigne le masculin et le féminin d'une certaine façon. Dans la, dans la répétition des mots chez, chez Solan, c'est passionnant. Un mot n'a jamais, jamais le même sens quand il est répété. So I will start from the, uh, the latest because the repetition in Talon is extremely important and the way that uh, Orkis and Orkis was, uh, the, the words were repeated is that uh, Talon uh, wanted to uh, evoke in front of Heidegger this 29th uh, 11, uh, event that happened and that uh, actually was a kind of uh, um, Decapit no, it's not decapitation, it's a restriction, of the, restriction of the masculinity and so uh, the of people, the, the uh, of, yes, people. annihilation of the uh, Jewish people. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, way of annihilating uh, the way they would produce. And it's for that at the end of the poem, it's genial, the last verse is feuchtes viel, which means literally the humid, a lot. Mais ce qui veut dire aussi de l'humide qui tombe, les larmes. Donc, mm -hmm. so the uh, the most powerful uh, verses are uh, at the at the very end of uh, the uh, poem uh, when it's everything is humid and it's uh, humid to the point that tears are going by. Right. Yes, yes, yes. The... Et, et cette humidité, elle est encore inscrite dans l'histoire. C'est l'humidité des marais dans lequel on jetait les juifs quand on ne pouvait plus, on voulait s'en débarrasser. Et, et, et Heidegger l'a emmené dans les marais. Parce que c'est beau, c'est intéressant. Schwarzwald, tourisme. So, so uh, Heidegger uh, took uh, Zelon, because they took long walks, and then he took him into those swamps, into uh, Schwarzwald uh, mountains, uh, where actually uh, many uh, Jewish people, Jewish uh, persons, uh, lost their lives. Moist, yes. Yes. All kinds of descriptions of general uh, morphing during the sexual acts. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know. Uh, but I also, I think it's just a more uncommon thing that we can put in the world of the future of the dimension of the world. In Germany, the word beer, the book, a propos of the moment, the word beer, it's a big one. Mais oui, je sais ça. Vous pouvez imaginer que la norme. Can you just just to the audience that the your your of course the word beer in German, it's a very recognized word. Usually you use the word fingerstrips, but you can also refer to the favorite or the favorite pulp. So there's a direct link between the use of hands and that the mouth. And the mountain beer becomes also a metaphor, whatever you want to call it, that connects speech to writing. And tree, the metaphor of the tree in his work is obvious, is linked with historical uh, and other connotations, associations, etc. Oui, mon propos n'était pas de commenter le, le poème, bien sûr. Je l'ai commenté dans mes séminaires. Et le dernier séminaire que j'ai fait a duré 4 heures sur ces seuls verbes. So, Professor Badiou uh, took 4 hours just to uh, comment on those uh, few lines of the poem. fantastic overall panel I think it set up this conference um, really well. I've got perhaps two questions if I may. One's very specific for Sue and then one more sort of general one. Um, Sue in your paper you sort of uh, well you sort of drew attention to how kind of open Salam is to parody and imitation I thought in your sort of characteristically generous way you found the value in the kind of fake 
more sort of satirical version of Salan's verse and possibly the limitations of the more sincere translations and imitations. Um, you've written a lot about um, Holocaust testimonies, or sorry, fabrications of Holocaust testimonies, fake memoirs and the like. And I wondered if you had any thoughts about the similarities or differences between these kind of literary deceptions that happen in prose and those that happen in verse. Because that seemed uh, kind of, uh, yeah, something that, that sort of your paper threw up. And then I have a more general question for everyone, which is, um, Professor Badger, you talked a lot about the significance of dates in Salam's poetry. Um, but Sue, you quoted from Zurich, the Stork Inn, and it made me think about something that wasn't really discussed, but the significance of place. Because often, like Salam's poems are read as very sort of abstract, philosophical, but with something like Zurich, the Stork Inn, where it's sort of really anchors it in a particular place. I wondered, you know, the significance of that for your understanding of his work. Thank you very much. Thanks, Matt, for two really good questions. And the first one is really significant. I think it seems less acceptable to imitate in prose a position you don't hold. That's how it seems. And I suppose maybe the reason for that is that in poetry, is it the case that as a genre, it is more about adopting a subject position that isn't your own anyway? Is that correct, perhaps, that there's more license to impersonate in poetry? So you can kind of, in fact, talking about that earlier, um, you can adopt a subject position that looks like your own, but it's not quite. So readers are used to that more than with prose, particularly prose testimony, which is, it is an aesthetic genre, but it's kind of non-fiction as well. What well, is poetry non-fiction, or not? So I suppose there is more leeway with poetry, it seems. Um, and also it raises all that question about what kind of, once you know a, a biographical fact about, or you think you know it, about um, the background to a piece of text, how can you separate it? So that some of the poetry does look like, as you said, an imitation or even a parody, when you know more about it, but it's interesting to try and do the mind experiment of reading it, putting that aside, and then see it a different text when you do read it in the last book. Um, and with, with Yasu Sada, some of the work was published in three different contexts, with the real person saying as a fake name, and after people knew. And actually, though the text stays the same, and you think it would make no difference, it actually does really change the reading, which goes against all that idea that the author is dead, and all of that kind of thing. So, Alors, je pense que, oui, c'était la question des dates et des lieux, c'est ça Alors, c'est une question fondamentale que j'essaie de résumer dans une formule euh, simple et qui revient aussi à revenir sur les propos qu'il vient de dire sur le, la question du biographique. Je pense que le poème, que le poème est euh, ancré dans, dans la vie, dans, dans la vie, et que il passe à l'existence en devenant poème publié. C'est-à-dire que So uh, about the question of uh, place besides this uh, what I treated uh, in uh, my talk uh, through dates. Uh, so the poem is uh, actually So the the uh, poem is enrooted in the life dans la contingence and dans, dans the contingency of the life of uh, contexts that are around her mais en tant que poème but as a poem il se hisse dans l'existence existe it yes it transcends it goes up it, it voilà. elevates voilà. itself over voilà. this that uh, pure existence et je dirais le paradoxe si je suis biographe c'est pour faire définitivement oublier la biographie de soi and as a biographer of Tzalon, it's something that indicates that we should actually completely uh, forget about the biography. Parce que les gens s'intéressent à la biographie et, et comme ils ne savent pas, ils sont obsédés par ça. Il faut leur donner et après ils peuvent lire les poèmes tranquillement. So people are just obsessed by the biographical facts and uh, they, they just want this as, as a uh, thing of the resources 
but so we can give them uh, dates and places and facts and then forget it. Bien sûr, j'essaie de ne pas être idiot en le faisant. Of course, I'm not trying to be an idiot. And, uh, yes. uh, I thank you very much. Noah, do you have a question? Uh, no, no, I just wanted to answer, answer your question. Uh, but I think that what comes up in the many questions, what uh, Bob was saying and uh, meant, uh, is uh, that um, uh, we are so used to, today to this uh, uh, testimony in the setting of, uh, of the court, uh, that, uh, that, that kind of almost of forensic uh, approach to testimony, uh, that uh, uh, suddenly testimony uh, to poetry or to other, uh, uh, in other settings um, is, is totally unacceptable. And, and you were saying about gathering testimonies today, so I think that uh, in, in doing this project uh, of, of naming it war and, and gathering, we got, uh, that's why we got um, a totally dis different response, uh, response because we got out of this uh, setting of, 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 of the court, of the things you have to prove. Uh, uh, we actually put the uh, more, more uh, um, emphasis on social relations, on, 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 on language, on the way people speak, on what happened to them uh, in language. Uh, so I think that uh, one of the aims of this, uh, um, um, this uh, conference is to try to uh, bring back into the public discourse the, the possibility of, of non-judicial uh, 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 discourse about testimony, about testifying. Uh, and um, also uh, I, I wanted to mention in this context is that uh, the whole uh, discussion, our whole discussion uh, in, in, in the Center of uh, Cultural Decontamination uh, started uh, about testimony, started with um, George Leibovich and his uh, testimony for he was um, he was in Auschwitz and he wrote he was he's a writer and a playwright and he wrote a few uh, all his um, poems all his um, uh, plays actually only uh, discuss one thing and that's the possibility of giving testimony and his uh, um, uh, most known uh, um, uh, most known play which is called the Himmel Commander. Uh, he, the play starts with the fact, uh, with the impossibility of, of, of giving testimony because uh, he himself is giving it it's, it's some way his own biography uh, and the play starts by a, a person who is uh, testifying for something he heard from uh, uh, somebody who was in the uh, email commander. So the, the, this whole idea of uh, giving testimony from like a, a, in the first person is totally excluded, and I think that this is a, a, a this is a very big question when when uh, today we gather. Uh, I mean, in another way, of course, uh, uh, Shoshana Feldman, Feldman deals with it, and and others. Uh, but uh, uh, I think that they. It, this, uh, all, all the time, this mediation that, that happens within testimony for people who, are, who gather testimonies who do this interview, it's very obvious that, that, that there's always a kind of medi mediation. So I mean, I, this kind of uh, expectation that there will be a, a, a forensic accuracy to, to testimony is a little bit... Uh, um, uh, it, it ha it, it's a, it's a, it's a expectation, expectation of one uh, very precise setting. Uh, uh, so we, we can think about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, I might add also, because Benveniste, when he developed uh, the, the etymology and the history of the testis testis, uh, he also spoke about arbiter, about the judge, 
And uh, strangely enough, we didn't evoke it, so you just add it as a, as a layer on. And uh, you're quite right, uh, in, a, in a court, at, when you're present at the court, uh, it's very strange amb uh, ambience, and then uh, there is no way that kind of a, I might not call it empathy, but maybe telepathy, or something that can bring us all together to think about a thing, the thing, maybe in the same way and not opposed because uh, when you're code you're opposed and if you are gathered together and think through language and this time we have poetical language and those who sublimely uh, introduced us to that structure of understanding maybe there is a part of reconciliation this is where re the reconciliation is coming through it's not uh, coming through opposition, never. So, uh, thank you very much. We will continue uh, our uh, next uh, uh, talk.